So today we're going to be talking about Arthur Machen's short novel, The Great God Pan. Now, The Great God Pan has a lot in common with the short stories in The King in Yellow, uh, particularly in that it blends certain features of decadence uh, with features of the Gothic. Um, now, one thing that we see coming into this that we didn't see in <clears throat> The King in Yellow are some elements of detective fiction um, as well, uh, plus a lot of pseudo-mystical bullshit floating around in the background. So be prepared for that. That is going to be fun. Um, so without further ado, let's get into the text. Let's talk about The Great God Pan. So Arthur Machen, seen as a middle-aged man here, is a Welshman. He was born in Curlian in Monmouthshire. This is one of the uh, parts of Britain that is most associated with the King Arthur legend. Um, and as a child, Machen was fascinated by the old Roman ruins that were all over uh, the, re the broader region, region which he grew up is called Gwent. Um, and there, yeah, there are ancient Roman ruins all over Gwent. So Machen spent much of his childhood exploring these ruins, cataloging these ruins, and hanging out in antiquarian museums and shops. Um, so he's very much interested in the sort of Romano-Celtic past of Britain. This is something that comes into a lot of his works, not just the great god Pan. Um, and he had rather a varied sort of career. Um, in addition to being an author of fiction and autobiography, um, he was also a journalist, an actor, a mystic, and an all-around believer in weird things. Um, he was a member of a number of different mystical societies, including uh, the great hermetic magical society of the uh, late 19th century in England, the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn, uh, which also included as, uh, as a member the great Irish poet William Butler Yeats. And Machen, like a lot of authors of popular fiction, was really, really prolific, probably more prolific than was actually good for him. Um, he published his first poem at the age of 20 and continued writing and publishing up until his death. He's really sort of one of those writers who probably published too much and probably could have afforded to cut back a little bit. Um, the real prime period of his career, though, right, sort of is in the 1890s. Um, and the reason why he produced his best work in this period is probably because for most of his career he was writing mostly for money. He was writing to make a living. In the 1890s, he had um, a small inheritance uh, in, on which he could live. Um, and so he was writing at his own pace with no need to please a commercial market. Now, Machen is interesting for a writer in this period um, in that, like, I usually look at decadence as a kind of proto-modernism. Right, a lot of the tendencies that would develop in modernist art, modernist fiction, um, have their first flowering, actually, in decadence. So as Victorianism and Romanticism die, modernism is sort of what blooms in the aftermath. Machen is aggressively anti-modernist, though. He is disinterested in discussions of literary form, and its effects. He is disdainful of, well, you know, he's interested in myth, but he's disdainful of discussions that make sort of myth the backing for literature. Um, to give you some examples of his attitudes, he wrote um, in um, a short book called Hieroglyphs, Hieroglyphics, um, some of his aesthetic criteria, and many of these are directly resistant to certain modernist artistic trends. Um, so these three, for example, 
this list that he composed, explain in rational terms the quest of the Holy Grail. State whether, in your opinion, such a vessel ever existed, and if you think it did not, justify your pleasure in reading the account of the search for it. So he seems to be assuming here that if there was no real Holy Grail, then why would you actually enjoy reading about uh, sort of this mythical object? Sort of sketchy, tenuous logic here, right? Secondly, explain logically your delight in color. State, in terms that Voltaire would have understood, the meaning of that phrase, the beauty of line. So this is an attack on obsessions over form, right? that what he's saying here is that you can't sum up your aesthetic response to any particular object um, merely by making reference to its properties of form, right? That there has to be some sort of something in the content that you connect with, something on a deeper level that actually sort of sparks something in you. Similarly, what do you mean by the word music? Give the rational explanations of box fugues showing to be as one, true as biology, and two, useful as applied mechanics. Now this, like much decadence, is anti-utilitarian, right? That you cannot explain the appeal of a piece of music by referring to its use value. Now, in his autobiography, Far Off Things, uh, published in 1922, Machen takes aim um, at the school of critics then prominent in England um, who are looking at myth as the basis of most literature and trying to figure out sort of how literature and myth are connected and how myth is connected to uh, ritual inherited from prehistoric peoples. So he's taking aim specifically here at Sir James Fraser's The Golden Bough. Of course, I am quite willing to allow that, as a general rule, an anxiety about the spring crops fully explains the origin of all painting, all sculpture, all architecture, all poetry, all drama, all music, all religion, all romance. I admit that the Holy Gospels are really all about spring cabbage, that Arthur is really Arator the plowman, that Galahad, denoting the achievement and end of the great quest, is Kalahad, the cabbage god. I admit all this because it is so entirely reasonable and satisfactory, and indeed self-evident. But though all Fraserdom should rise up against me, I cannot allow that when I lit my dark lantern, I was inviting the sun to help the crops. So what he is arguing here is that myth criticism, looking for the source of all art in myth, and the source of myth in primitive ritual, um, is utilitarianism by another name, right? Clearly, we can't simply do these things because they're valuable in themselves. Clearly, we do them because we gain some sort of material benefit from them. The cabbage rises in the fields, right, for Kalahad, the cabbage god. Now, one of the things that Machen seems to object to most is the demystification of the world around him affected by science. Right? He does not like the way science tends to dismantle the magical, the numinous, right? the spiritual, invisible world. And so, much of his best work actually um, consists of attacks on the probings of scientists. And indeed, scientists in his texts often do things that are sort of akin to magic. Um, more on that in a little while. Now, as far as the history of this particular text is concerned, um, it does have actually a kind of interesting history in part because um, it was not received the way Machen really wanted it to be. There's a short version of the tale that's first published in a magazine called The Whirlwind in 1890, right? Almost all of these texts have, have their first life uh, in a periodical of some sort. The short novel form is then published in an omnibus edition um, by the 
publisher John Lane in 1894. Um, it was included with another short novel called The Inmost Light. And this is what the frontispiece looked like. Now, Machen objected to being grouped with the decadents. He didn't feel his work had much in common with the work of Oscar Wilde or Aubrey Beardsley um, or Ernest Dosen or Lionel Johnson or other prominent uh, decadent figures. But because his novels often included Beardsley or Beardsley-esque illustrations like we see here and were published by John Lane, the publisher of The Decadence, publisher of choice anyway for The Decadence, um, and often included explicit references to sex and ancient rituals and drugs and magic and all sorts of things the decadents were obsessed with, you can sort of see why contemporary critics tended to lump him into this group, however much he disliked it. Now, when The Great God Pan came out, it received pretty savage reviews. Like, it sold well, it was popular, but critics hated it. Uh, the, uh, the critic for the Westminster Gazette, for example, in 1894, wrote, it is an incoherent nightmare of sex and the supposed mysteries behind it, such as might conceivably possess a man given to brooding over these matters, but which would lead to insanity if unrestrained. I imagine, however, that Mr. Mockin's desire has simply been to emulate certain French pr practitioners in this line. Indeed, the fact that he is so often reduced to gasping negatives proves that he has not made it clear to even to himself what he is after. His work is innocuous from its absurdity, but the type is most truly decadent. One thing we see in this critic's response is his inability to understand the form of the weird. Right? <clears throat> when he talks about Machen's language, and its tendency to define things in terms of gasping negatives, right? One thing we have to remember that is a feature of the weird generally is this encounter with that which cannot be adequately described, that which cannot be adequately contained in language. And I think that Helen Vaughn, particularly in her death throes, is exactly this sort of thing, right? This sort of creature that these Victorian gentlemen whom she encounters cannot quite accommodate to their reality. And that accounts for the gasping negatives that this critic objects to so strenuously. So, in a lot of ways, this is a story about science in that it describes the results of an experiment gone awry. And it would be wrong to think of aestheticism and decadence themselves as being anti-science discourses. In fact, most decadent writers uh, were pretty well informed on scientific matters and often quite interested in them. Now, while aestheticism did promote an, arts, an art for art's sake sort of viewpoint, and one of the founders of the aestheticist movement, the French writer Théophile Gautier, wrote, literature has nothing to do with usefulness. The most useful place in any house is the toilet. And the thoroughgoing aestheticist denies that art has any kind of moral, intellectual, didactic purpose. That doesn't preclude for the decadent writer or artist an interest in pure science, right? In the pursuit of knowledge for its own sake. However, there are certain scientific trends in the late 19th century which aestheticism finds itself at odds with. The most important is probably uh, positivism. Now, positivism is the belief that certain knowledge, that is positive knowledge, right, 
is drawn only from sense impressions of natural external phenomena that are then processed by human reason. So the only things you can know, right, you can only know a positive, you can't know a negative. And you can only know a positive through direct sensory experience, right, through direct sensory proof. It's a sort of development of uh, the empiricist philosophy that was really popular in Britain in the 18th century. Then synthesized a little bit of continental rationalism. We already talked a little bit about utilitarianism, right? The idea that all ideas are to be judged by their usefulness. And that Victorian myth of progress, right? The idea that technological advancement always leads to improvements in the human condition, right? The more we advance scientifically, the more we advance technologically, the better life is going to get, right? Tell that to all those truck drivers who are going to be put out of work by self-driving cars. So, science. So let's talk a little bit more about where decadence and aestheticism uh, meet up with science. So I think this is a sort of interesting area of exploration. Um, now, in The Soul of Man Under Socialism, in 1891, Oscar Wilde wrote, when scientific men are no longer called upon to go down to a depressing East End and distribute bad cocoa and worse blankets to starving people, they will have a delightful leisure in which to devise wonderful and marvelous things for their own joy and the joy of everyone else. So what Wilde seems to be advocating is right, that once science is no longer necessary for simply meeting the basic human needs of the population, scientists can pursue knowledge for its own sake, much as artists can pursue art for its own sake. Right? And ad uh, he's advocating here total pure science, or pursuit of knowledge for the sake of the pursuit of knowledge. And Walter Pater, even earlier, sort of the godfather of the decadence in England, in 1873 in his studies in the history of the Renaissance, wrote, it is with this movement, with the passage and dissolution of impressions, images, sensation, that analysis leaves off, that continual vanishing away, that strange, perpetual weaving and unweaving of ourselves. Right? The idea here that the self is made up of sense impressions that are constantly fluctuating, constantly in motion. Right? The self is something that we are constantly constructing by taking in stimuli from the external world. And that's Walter Pater. Nice mustache. Now Machen combines the scientific practices of a character like uh, the character Dr. Raymond with a philosophy from the decadent era in antiquity, right? Sort of the, from the late Hellenistic period called Neoplatonism. Neoplatonism is the basis for most sort of Western uh, ceremonial, formal, magical practices. Right, so a Neoplatonist, here we have the founder of the Hermetic philosophy, the mythical founder of the Hermetic philosophy, Hermes Trismegistus, or thrice great Hermes, holding a spinning globe and pointing to the twin essences here of sun and moon. So a Neoplatonist believes that all creation derives from a single unified principle called the One. But those of us in the material world do not have direct access to the One. The physical world was created by an inferior double of the One called the Demiurge. And the world of phenomena, that is the visible physical world that we can see, hear, smell, touch, taste, is but a shadow of 
of the real world of the one, right? Which is a world of pure ideas. Now, I don't know how many of you are familiar with uh, with Plato, with Platon, with regular Platonic philosophy, you know, minus the Neo. Um, Plato also argued that what was what was real was the world of ideas, and the world of phenomena was a sort of pale shadow of that. What a Neoplatonist argues is that you can, in fact, uh, sort of get past this world of shadows and directly access uh, this world of ideas through certain magical practices. Now, we see a direct endorsement of this kind of philosophy coming from Dr. Raymond in the first chapter as he is speaking to Clark, the witness of his, exper of his experiment. Look about you, Clark. You see the mountain, and hill following after hill is wave on wave. You see the woods and orchard, the fields of ripe corn, and the meadows reaching to the reed beds by the river. You see me standing here beside you and hear my voice. But I tell you that all these things, yes, from that star that has just shone out in the sky to the solid ground beneath our feet, I say that all these are but dreams and shadows. The shadows that hide the real world from our eyes. There is a real world. But it is beyond this glamour and this vision. Beyond these chases and arrows, dreams and a career. Beyond them all as beyond a veil. I do not know whether any human being has ever lifted that veil. But I do know, Clark, that you and I shall see it lifted this very night from before another's eyes. You may think this all strange nonsense. It may be strange, but it is true, and the ancients knew what lifting the veil means. They called it seeing the god Pan. So Raymond is promising to do through science what the ceremonial magician attempted to do um, through drawing magic circles on the ground and waving about various powders and chanting various prayers and spells, right? By making an incision in the brain of his unfortunate servant girl, whom he says he, he rescued from the streets and, you know, Kevess can do as he likes with her, he intends to show that scientifically human beings can directly access the Neoplatonic One. Right, this world of ideas beyond our physical reality. But when these worlds blend, right, in the person particularly of Helen Vaughn, the offspring of the unfortunate servant girl, who of course immediately goes mad um, upon <coughs> witnessing this, you know, the, the, the truth of existence, The self becomes unstable. The idea of the single unitary self operating in the world of phenomena is broken down, as we see when Helen dies. Right? The doctor who witnesses her death says, I know that the body may be separated into its elements by external agencies, but I should have refused to believe what I saw. For here there was some internal force, of which I knew nothing, that caused dissolution and change. Here, too, was all the work by which man had been made repeated before my eyes. I saw the form waver from sex to sex, dividing itself from itself, and then again reunited. Then I saw the body descend to the beasts whence it ascended, and that which was on the heights go down to the depths, even to the abyss of all being. The principle of life, which makes the organism, always remained while the outward form changed. The light within the room had turned to blackness, not the darkness of night, in which objects are seen dimly, for I could see clearly and without difficulty, but it was the negation of light. Objects were presented to my eyes, if I may say so, without any medium, in such a manner that if there had been a prism in the room, I should have seen no colors represented in it. I watched, and at last I saw nothing but a substance as jelly. Then the ladder was ascended again, 
Here the manuscript is illegible. For one instance, I saw a form shaped in the dimness before me, which I will not farther describe. But the symbol of this form may be seen in ancient sculptures and in paintings which survived beneath the lava, too foul to be spoken of. As a horrible and unspeakable shape, neither man nor beast was changed into human form, there came finally death. So when Helen Vaughn dies, she goes backwards and forwards through the evolutionary change, right? We have here that Victorian dread of degeneration, right? Of devolution, right? If we can have ascended from ape-like creatures, we can always descend back into something else. And when she reaches the final rock bottom of descent, before changing back into human form, the thing she turns into is the form of the god Pan, right? One half goat, the other half man, right? The beast god. Now, it's also worth noting here, this part which says here the manuscript is illegible, right? This is another tendency of the weird that I think is adopted largely from uh, novels like Frankenstein and from Dracula that are told largely in the form of letters and diary entries. Right? The idea is that you are going over this discovered manuscript that lets you in on some kind of dark secret that was discovered by the writer and then left behind. Um, this will be really, really important when we read The Call of Cthulhu. And here we have an artist's rendition of what Helen Vaughn's death would have looked like. Isn't that disgusting? Now the figure of Pan, by the late 19th century, had taken on a very different sort of connotation than that which he had um, <clears throat> in the work of the, Rom the major romantics. Right, so we all know about Pan, right? the Greek god of the wild places with the horns and legs of a goat, the head and torso of a man, known for playing beautifully upon the pipes and for chasing lustily after nymphs. Now, among the romantics, Pan was usually a sort of gentle pastoral figure, a shepherd god, right, who gently pipes out in the fields and puts the shepherds and the animals to sleep, the shepherds and the, their animals to sleep, right. So we see examples of this uh, in uh, Keats's Hymn to Pan and Percy Shelley's uh, Hymn of Pan, uh, written within a year of each other. But. <clears throat> The god's name is also the source of our word panic, right? Panic being, you know, for the Greeks, the kind of terror that descended on people when the beast god was coming their way, or when the beast was upon them. And it's that that comes back into the figure of Pan, right? This hybrid human animal figure who represents, you know, something more ancient, more primal than the Olympian gods represent. Um, and that's, yeah, that's what creeps back into representations of Pan um, in the fin de siècle, in the 1880s, 1890s. The Pan of these texts is usually violent, disruptive, beast-like, he's sexually aggressive, and he is an overturner of the prevailing order. Right, Pan brings chaos. And his daughter, Helen Vaughn, does exactly the same thing, right? In the Welsh village, where she is kept as a child, she drives one boy mad and drives a girl whom she befriends to suicide, right? Both the children of prominent citizens. When she comes to London as an adult, right, she insinuates herself into the aristocracy and <clears throat> disrupts that social order, right, by 
bringing, bringing them into these sort of low pits of iniquity um, by shaming and disgracing them and finally convincing them to commit suicide. Right. Helen Vaughn is an overturner of social order as well. Right. She only preys on relatively high class victims. Now, she's also in some ways related to the late Victorian figure of the new woman. Now, at the time that The Great God Pan was written, it was still about, was it 20 years or so, um, before women actually got the vote in the United Kingdom. But there was a strong women's suffrage movement underway. And there was, a, a, particularly among younger women, um, there was um, a movement <clears throat> for certain basic rights for women that had long been uh, denied. Uh, women should have, should be able to get around on their own, right? So a lot of these new women wore bikes. Right? Their clothing tended to become um, more, less sort of frilly and lacy, often a little bit more androgynous. You know, many of them wore pants, smoked cigarettes or cigars, um, took jobs, ooh, sometimes even after marriage, often delayed or refused, delayed marriage or refused to marry. Um, you know, denied their, you know, denied the prescribed role for a Victorian woman as wife and mother. So we see some examples of this in Helen Vaughan. Right? Everyone who saw her at the police court said she was at once the most beautiful woman and the most repulsive they had ever set eyes on. I have spoken to a man who saw her, and I assure you he positively shuddered as he tried to describe the woman, but he couldn't tell why. She seems to have been a sort of enigma, and I expect that if one dead man could have told tales, he would have told some uncommonly queer ones. So, this encounter with the uncanny is, in many ways, an encounter with a woman who doesn't seem quite right to the men who run into her. Right, we see that Helen Vaughan is an ind largely independent woman who operates under a variety of aliases and is able to get men under her thumb, in part through her sexual allure. And this was one element of the sort of the new, win the new woman persona, right? This was not just, okay, by and large, the, the new woman persona was not, you know, like a turnoff to male Victorians. Um, it was actually an often, an oftentimes sort of highly sexualized. And so what we see here is the attraction to and repulsion from the idea of the new woman. She would be called very handsome, I suppose, and yet there was something about her face which I didn't like. The features are exquisite, but the expression is strange. And all the time I was looking at her, and afterwards, when I was going home, I had a curious feeling that very expression was in some way or another familiar to me. Right, similar sort of occurrence in this particular quote. They're turned on and turned off simultaneously by Helen Vaughn, but can't quite tell why. And some of this, I think, is explained by the threat she represents to the prevailing social order. I think it's also interesting to note in this context, right, when she's dying and degenerating, she degenerates into both masculine and feminine forms, right? She goes back and forth between sexes. So I think that also speaks to some anxiety about the new woman. All right, so for next time, you're going to be reading just the first half of that little Wonder Tales book, right, that I asked you to purchase. Just the Book of Wonder uh, by Lord Dunsany. And I want you to consider the following. First, Most of these stories originated as illustrations. Right? Dunsany commissioned the artist Sidney Syme 
to draw pictures for him. And then Dunsany made up stories based on those pictures. So to what extent do these stories reflect their origins in visual images? I also want you to think about what means Dunsany uses to exoticize his tales and why that matters. Third, how many of these tales provide any sort of exposition or world building? Right. Do they actually give you any sort of origin story for any of these characters? Do they actually build up an environment for you? Or are you just kind of thrown into the world without any real explanation? And if we are given that little to go on, so what? Finally, I want you to think about the ways in which Dunsany's fantasy landscape links up with the real world. All right, that'll do it for today. Uh, we'll see you next time to talk about Lord Dunsany.